Welcome back to another entry in What the Hell Even Happens in Metal Gear Solid 2. I'm your host, Joran Lee. We'll pick up where we left off so long ago at the end of the Fat Man fight. Identify yourself. I'm like you. I have no name. Are you Mr. X? <laughs> but come, let's get out of the open. Follow me. MGS2 is at bottom a game about information. What's this door? I don't know. It's huge. What the hell is it? It's not in our intel. Right. We have no way at the moment to open that door. Leave it alone and proceed with the mission. Understood. But to see how this works in practice, we'll need to go through the post-Fat Man sequence up to roughly the Harrier battle with somewhat of a fine-tooth comb. So, here it goes. This is going to take a lot of inductive reasoning, which always proves a little dicey. But here, I'll argue for a precise way to read MGS2 to figure out how precisely you, Raiden, are being steered by not one, but two differing wings of the Patriots, led separately by the Colonel AI, Campbell, and Revolver Ocelot, respectively. Apologies if, as an information game, things get convoluted here. I'm going to do my best to explain clearly. Let's go. First, an overview. After the Fat Man battle, and after telling us the terrorists have retaliated for us dismantling the bombs by them starting to shoot hostages in the head on the roof one every hour, our overseers, under the control of AI Colonel Campbell, direct us to follow the instructions of a bizarre cyborg ninja, styled exactly more or less like the one of Shadow Moses fame. Except that was actually, as anyone who's read In the Darkness of Shadow Moses knows, Frank Yeager, alias Gray Fox, and he died by the end of that incident. So as we'll soon be told about the character Snake, either he survived, or there are two of them. In this case, that likely makes this ninja a mere cosplayer, an imposter, whose identity, of course, we won't have divulged for us until later. Just a messenger from the Lali Lule Lo. But even if we don't know yet who that ninja is, we know we can't completely trust them. But we learn here how to trust while remaining on our guard, or trusting up to only the point of convenience. As Raiden, this is a key lesson that we'll spend this entire sequence learning, as Raiden repeatedly finds him slash ourselves forced to take seriously things that are said by people who, in other ways, absolutely must be lying. Good work, Raiden. Looks like all the bombs are neutralized. One of their main leverages is now gone. That leaves... Colonel, Fat Man didn't seem to know about the ransom demands. Intentionally kept in the dark, I'd say. He seemed to be coming from a very different place from the other terrorists. Hmm. Right. A lot of hostages, our president included, are still in danger. Keep your mind focused on protecting them. After infiltrating the core of Shell-1 and rendezvousing with our VIP rescue target, the Secret Service member known only as Colonel Ames, Raiden obtains crucial intel on the enemy's true intentions, capabilities, and even loyalties, apparently from the inside. But we only think we're getting away with spying on Dead Cell, the enemy unit, from inside their own system. In actuality, virtually everyone here has something to hide from us. We just don't know it yet, or see exactly how the pieces of this chessboard all fit together. And that's where I come in. So while Raiden double times it to the Shell 1-2 connecting bridge to get ambushed by two to three separate named contenders as the real legendary Solid Snake, let's reverse gear and take this again in more detail. <laughs> what exactly do you find so funny? Charades usually are humorous. I wouldn't have minded watching some more of it, 
But we're running a little short on time. What are you talking about? Everything you've done here has been scripted. A little exercise set up by us. Exercise? The S3 plan was conceived as a means to produce soldiers on par with Solid Snake. That's what I told you. But the VR training the boy was put through is not the meat of the project. You think this little terrorist incident is your own doing, Solidus? This is the S3 training kernel. An orchestrated recreation of Shadow Moses. What? So here's the rub. Ocelot is working for the Patriots, for Dead Cell, for Solidus, and most and truest of all, for himself. So he's a bit difficult to track throughout the game. However, as I'm about to show, he may be the single most important actor here to track, because he is to this game what an MGS5 Unit XOF wound up being for Unit Fox. In other words, Ocelot is your tail, the one behind the scenes, ensuring that the mission will wind up a success and that you will survive. Traces of the perpetrator, no differently than Fat Man, are evident only by, for lack of a better word, smell. In Ocelot's case, it is the smell of sadism. Allow me to explain that strange comment. I know Fat Man well. I know how into his own aesthetics he is. Signatures? Yes. On every bomb he builds, he always leaves a trace of the cologne he uses. He forces us to do the bidding of that ninja leaving us with no other way forward. Yet when the moment to actually hurt Ocelot seems to come, the strike, this time, won't land. Relishing no doubt in our suffering, Ocelot pulls back his hand last minute. This is just a case in point for how his sadism as the dominant orchestrator operates. But what's difficult is who Ocelot is orchestrating at any one point for. To make matters really delicious, he dynamically changes roles throughout the game, only truly serving at a given time the master best then and there suited and equipped to benefit his long-term master plan. Often he'll play two sides against each other, and sometimes those two sides' goals will coincide, so it's very difficult to know at any one time who he's really working for or why. Keep in mind what that plan, his master plan, will result in is going to be two things. An either real or merely simulated successful field test of the S3 plan, the Patriots' system for societal sanity, and two, an even bigger mass media event that they'll fail to control. Bigger than the infamy of Shadow Moses, this time the event, the incident, will be in Manhattan, when their arsenal ship will run aground, and the former U.S. President George Sears will be killed on the steps of Federal Hall. The fallout of this, combined with the divulgence of the Big Shell offshore plant, not really being an offshore cleanup facility at all, well, this will wind up exposing much, most, or even nearly all that they, the Patriots, and this entire exercise was meant to hide, and ironically only brought about to use as the basis for this very simulation. So, we've covered Ocelot's rough game-wide aims, which is ultimately part of his master plan of trying to bring down the Patriots. But how does he get to there? 
Well, a big part of this is utilizing the various factions and rivalries within the Sons of Liberty outfit, by which I loosely refer to the combination of Dead Cell, Solidus, the Glukovich Army, and the Turncoats who used to work for the President's security detail. The biggest example one will actually see playing out here in the core of Shell 1 is between Ocelot himself and Olga Gerlukovich. Who is that cyborg ninja, Shalashaska? I cannot even guess. What about you? I'm having the matter looked into. Olga, don't cast suspicion where it isn't due. Where it isn't due? When you watched my father die and did nothing. It's been two years ago, Olga. Let it go. I read the case file for Shadow Moses, by the way. Olga, how could you suspect me? I know that the ninja is not one of my men. To pursue not only her terrible lust for revenge against Ocelot for her father's mysterious death, which we saw in the Tanker chapter, but also to pursue the ensured longevity of her child, secretly kept by the Patriots as a nanomachine locked prisoner, Olga will play out her twin roles flawlessly as Olga Gerlukovich and the Cyborg Ninja. Except only one of them will she recognize as being just an act. That one is her role as Cyborg Ninja. The deeper role that she'll play much more unwittingly will be that of Olga Gerlukovich, the rebel inside the whale that's inside the even bigger whale. Her role, in other words, as a key figure, intimately wrapped up in layered conspiracy after conspiracy, will prove necessary for Raiden's progression to the end of this game. But not for a while. For now, Olga is merely Ninja, and Ninja directs you how to, in a nice touch of ironic foreshadowing, blend in to the enemy's ranks and move among the most heavily fortified of their citadels, Shell 1, the Shell 1 core. Here we see some of that cologne-scented sadism signature of Ocelot, however. Your uniform is so small that any enemy who bumps into it will ruin your disguise. Looks pretty good on you. Cut it out. It's bad enough that I'm dripping with sweat, wondering when somebody's gonna see through my disguise. Don't worry, and quit being so sensitive. At least your walk won't give you away. My walk? What do you mean, my walk? <sighs> Nothing. Forget I said it. I'd worry more about the fact that the uniform's a little small for your size. It just might come off when you bump into an enemy. Normally, a proper fitting uniform is issued to a soldier. You're just going to have to fit your movement to the uniform. That makes this entire sequence inside the Shell 1 core a gentle yet recognizable echo of the Revolver Ocelot boss fight in MGS1. One false move and kaboom, game over. But that's not even mentioning the biometric scanner and the necessity of a directional microphone, which Ocelot has presumably placed for you sadistically on the same floor as a recreation, more or less, of Hal's office from Shadow Moses, taunting you with the impossible, precise symmetry. This is the little gizmo. There's no such thing as miracles or the supernatural. Only cutting-edge technology. As he later tell us himself, all along this section we're growing more and more into the memory of Shadow Moses. But Olga is far from the only actor in Ocelot slash and or the Patriots drama convinced it's actually happening. The second one for our concerns here is, of course, Colonel Ames, the former DIA colonel and ex-husband of Nastasha Romanenko. Passed by the Patriots with helping us on what becomes our new secret mission, sadistic in the extreme, to not save but assassinate the president, James Johnson. That's right, the very POTUS that we first came here to rescue. Right. The terrorists have retaliated for our bomb neutralization. What? A hostage has been killed, shot in the head. They shot one of them on the roof, just to make sure we caught it. One of our satellites caught it clear as day. Damn. They announced they would kill one every hour from now on. You don't think he's been like the other hostages? Hmm? A hostage was killed in retaliation after the SEAL-10 disaster, remember? What are you talking about? What are my orders? What should I do? Stay with your mission objective. Rescue the president. Right. A lot of hostages, our president included, are still in danger. Regardless of what they do to other hostages, they won't touch the president. Following the bomb scare and the meetup with the ninja, here's the situation as Raiden knows it. 
eco-terrorists are holding the president hostage for a ransom of $30 billion. What are their demands? $30 billion. $30 billion? What makes them think they can get that much? There was a government-sponsored tour going on at the Big Shell that day. Hostages, huh? A VIP from one of the major conservation groups and one from our own government. The most important person in a sense. The most important person? James Johnson. The president? If their demands go unmet, they plan to use the president's black case to activate Metal Gear as a nuclear platform, secretly being housed by the Big Shell, to destroy the facility, poisoning the coastline for generations. You saw it too, I believe. The Navy man with half a handcuff. The other half of it is on the football, or the black case if you like. The nuclear button. And now they have it. And to underscore the terrorists' seriousness, they've started executing hostages on the roof, one every hour. The hostages are being held in the B-1 conference hall, in the Shell-1 core. You'll find Ames there. What does he look like? We don't know if it is indeed a he. I've never met this person either. How am I supposed to look for someone without even a description? Use your ears. What's that supposed to mean? Ames has a pacemaker. You'll be able to hear the machine sound in the heartbeat. You expect me to walk up to these hostages and listen to every one of their heartbeats? The sound is too minute to detect and amplify. You'd be captured immediately. So what am I supposed to do? Use the directional microphone. There's one somewhere in the core. I suggest you hurry. They have the nuke on their side. The nuke? They have a nuclear weapon with them? You didn't find their continuing presence here unusual? Even with the president as hostage, this is an island, and they have no visible means of escape. Even if they do have a nuke, the warhead is no good without an access code. The security lockout can't be bypassed. They don't need to. They have the code. You saw it too, I believe. The Navy man with half a handcuff. The other half of it is on the football, or the black case if you like. The nuclear button. And now they have it. Why did they have to bring the football along? To a decontamination plant of all places. But they did have to. Because, after all, the big shell is the farthest thing from a cleanup plant there is. What? Dead Cell didn't have to bring a nuke along with them. It was right here to begin with. Nothing in this affair is what it seems. A cover-up? But why? For what? For Metal Gear that is housed here. Metal Gear? The very same. By the only favorite from the airport, Shadow Moses in free. This place is the R&D center for its newest incarnation. What the hell is going on? <laughs> Better ask Ames the rest. Following this intel gathering session with Ames, here's the new reality as we, as Raiden, understand it. The president is actually working with the terrorists who need him alive to launch their nuke, which has always been no threat but their objective all along. They never were asking for an actual ransom. This nuke will be aimed not at the Big Shell itself, but at the skies over Manhattan, where, thanks to the EMMA pulse of a standard nuclear payload, the detonation will cut New York off from the mainland, allowing the terrorists to seize control in some version of the American Revolution as the modern-day Sons of Liberty. In both of these versions of reality, these terrorists are being led by none other than the legendary Solid Snake. Ames explains that the president's life has never really been in danger, and in reality he must be working with the terrorists, that the detonation of a nuclear weapon is not the threat but the objective, that there are no hostages being executed on the roofs, that yes, as that ninja told us, the Big Shell is secretly housing a secret next generation Metal Gear, and finally, that the enemy force apparently truly is being led by the real Solid Snake. It's all enough to make our heads spin. Spin so badly we scarcely detect Ames's latent suggestion, which is that the president, merely a figurehead, has to die to protect the real source of power behind the stars and stripes, the la le lu le lo, called by Solidus, for our benefit and hearing it for the first time as Raiden, the Patriots. 
Raiden will not fully grasp his role before it's nearly too late. But thankfully, Ocelot will ensure you do the right thing for your country, the sly devil. Simply by virtue of knowing where and how to find Ames, not to mention having made contact with that ninja, we convince Ames that we're okay for him to give intel to. Ames was planted to supposedly keep tabs on the president, undercover as a member of secret security, but in reality a former colonel with the DIA. Starting to get a bad feeling about this yet? He only learns a partial truth about his real role here as he dies, namely that Ocelot and the Patriots have conspired to use Ames as a pawn towards recreating aspects of the Shadow Moses incident. Ames' pacemaker, the Patriots hijack to simulate a Fox Die style sudden heart attack. Right at the perfect moment. That's right, even in death, Ames remains their plaything. Their puppet. Thanks to Ocelot's tactics, poor Raiden will even mistake Rex for that secret new Metal Gear prototype that the Big Shell conceals and become convinced their doomsday device is already active. Crucially, it was here that President Johnson was scheduled to make a televised speech from the Big Shell, a fitting playroom then for many different kinds of charades. Convinced of our bona fides as, like him, a fellow patriot plant, Ames, and the intimate, if staged, insider's meeting that we think we witnessed next to him, all bombard Raiden with intel that cancels out much of what we thought we knew about not only this ongoing terrorist incident, but the Big Shell facility itself. Then, we barely manage to escape, unmasked, only to wind up face-to-face -face with multiple possible solid snakes and an enemy Harrier jet. Again, this whole section introduces the cruciality to MGS2 of information and information games. We're really talking now about social engineering and game theory, a discipline born of the nuclear age at the height of the Cold War, one obsessed with gamifying the rules of human behavior within information vacuums. Without total proof of things, human beings often must make assumptions or follow predictable patterns of reasoning in the absence of hard truths. In a way, this is the essence of the S3 plan, devising a way for the Patriots to engineer human behavior so that even without complete control over the flow of information itself, the Patriots will retain ultimate control over the ways this information gets processed or received. This has necessitated, also given the S3 plan's field test attempts to recreate a facsimile of the Shadow Moses incident, a simulated information breach. And that's what this scene with Ames is. Haven't they told you anything? The entire thing was planned. The oil spill, the tanker accident that caused it, everything. The big shell was built specifically for the development of a new Metal Gear model. The inspection tour was to check its progress. What's going on around here? As the ninja says, we as Raiden are not yet fully trusted enough to decide for ourselves what to believe and disbelieve. That's the end goal for the entire game. I've been ordered to give you backup, including a relaying of necessary intel. Ordered by whom? Why won't you identify yourself? There is no need for you to know. I'll decide whether I need to know. You are not yet trusted to make such decisions. <sighs> I'll tell you something you do need to know instead. The current location of the president. What? Or rather, the person who knows the current location of the president. Who is it? Yet, we are given a taste of uncontrolled information here. Told unwittingly by the Patriot Pawn Ames, many truths which fly in the face of all we've been briefed about. These get jumbled together with outright lies, like how Dead Cell's leader is actually Solid Snake. Lost in this flood of information, it's impossible for Raiden to independently verify or believe any of this. Too far. Yet we follow our orders and play out our role all the same, if only for a simple lack of any better alternative. This underscores the real reason for the ninja's laugh at the beginning of this section. Why are you telling me this? Do I need to repeat myself? There's no reason for me to believe any of this. You understand that? Of course, but you also have no choice but to believe. Do you have any other leads? Where are those hostages? <laughs> now, sticking with the theme of anonymity and information, notice that Ames is fooled into thinking that you are much more well-informed than you actually are, given simply that you've met up with the ninja, something he assumes only a relatively highly placed Patriot operator would have knowledge of. But he, in actuality, only has his assumptions. He's been stuck in this room, and that's where our game theory comes in. 
And those assumptions are ones that the Patriots have carefully manipulated all to test the S3 plant's efficacy as a fail-safe system for controlling the spread of unauthorized information. Many of the things he tells us, as I mentioned, we're supposed to believe we weren't really supposed to know. But the actual goal is for us to get this information leak and to bring about a full simulation of the events of MGS-1, including this growing sense that we've been lied to and we're being used. Raiden, however, has no idea, even at the end of Ames' little speech, what Ames assumes has been made clear, that our next true objective isn't saving Johnson, it's assassinating him. Pliskin's unwitting role to play for us is often to stand as Colonel Campbell's foil, somebody with a real eye on our objective, who knows things we don't and seems to confirm and or deny what we're told independently. Pliskin, do you read me? What's up, Ryden? I just ran into a guy decked out like a, a ninja. A ninja? Yeah. Do you know anything about this? No. Can you trust that costumed freak? I don't know, but the colonel told me to follow the guy's instructions. And like a good soldier, you'll do it, right? I'll let you in on a little secret, kid. The ninja that was publicized in the Shadow Moses incident no longer exists. The guy you met has no connection whatsoever with the incident. And how do you know that? Because I do. Huh? Just be careful who you trust, okay? Raiden, Rosemary has a report for you on Ames. Jack, it's about Ames. Did you find anything? Yeah, only that there's nothing to find. What? There is not a single record, let alone his social security number, address, or background. I couldn't even find Ames' gender, age, or full name. What does that mean? All I found out was Ames. Just that one word. Hmm. Even still, Ames is our way to the president. We'll have to make contact. Head for floor B1 in the core of Shell 1. Pliskin. Do you know anything about a Secret Service agent named Ames? Ames? You've heard of him? Uh, no. Listen, if you know anything... No, I got the name mixed up with someone else. Forget it. In reality, as one of Ocelot's borderline pawns, Snake, a.k.a. Pliskin, and the AI, a.k.a. Campbell, represent two sides of the same system all designed to support your mission and ensure success according to that mission's original parameters. That nobody has the big picture all at once well enough to see what's fully going on isn't a bug of the S3 plan. No, it's a major feature. But more on S3, we'll just have to wait. Just keep in mind for now, it's designed around black boxes, precisely not being able to see or understand everything at once. Like when you and Ames, for example, subvert Ocelot's surveillance via nanocommunication.